so my name is Bart Bausas. I'm professor of big data and analytics or data science at the best university in, in Belgium and far beyond, obviously, which is the Catholic University of Leuven. Um, um, I have a research team of about 10 PhD st students there, all working on analytics. So some of them work on developing new techniques, new ways of analyzing data, whereas others study innovative applications thereof. And we study a very wide realm of applications, uh, ranging from credit risk modeling. That was my first love. So I uh, started doing lots of research in credit risk modeling. Uh, but then I realized that actually many of the ideas that were uh, early on developed in credit risk modeling could be successfully used in other settings as well. One of them being the very topic of this presentation, which is fraud analytics. At this very moment, I'm also further zooming out towards other related areas, one of them being customer lifetime value modeling. Um, I'm also a part-time lecturer at the University of Southampton in uh, the United Kingdom. I have a, a YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter account, which you can, they're all named data mining apps. Uh, on the YouTube account, you will see lots of free movies uh, there. Um, if you want, you can uh, connect on Facebook, on Twitter. LinkedIn is a bit of a difficult one because despite this era of big data in which we're living, there's a maximum limit on uh, the number of LinkedIn connections that you can have. And I unfortunately reached out. It's a maximum of 30,000 connections. But if you send me um, an invite, um, then I'll do my best to accept it because I'm uh, dying to kick some of the recruiters out, right? So you know that uh, amongst those 30 uh, K connections, there's quite a bit of recruiters actually, which I urgently need to kick out. I also have my own uh, online learning platform, which is bluecourses.com. I think I have a slide. No, I don't have a slide. Um, it's an online platform where you can find lots of online courses um, and where we also um, sponsor or contribute to uh, firms cleaning up the oceans or precious oceans from uh, plastic. So we have a sustainability purpose connected to our website. So if you register uh, for one of the courses, we have one on fraud analytics, by the way, on our website, then we pledge to invest 20% of our EBIT, which is our earnings before interest and taxes, to, ocean, to um, companies cleaning up or um, precious oceans from plastic. Okay, so let's uh, kick off by setting the stage. And, you know, fraud is all around these days. And here you can see some numbers, uh, not very important, just to indicate the size uh, but a typical organization loses about 5% of its revenues due to fraud each year, right? This is a, a statement that was put forward by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, or the ACFE. Uh, some other numbers, the total cost of non-health insurance fraud in the U.S. is estimated to be more than $40 billion per year. Fraud epidemic costs the U.K. about £110 billion. In other words, I'm not going to go through all the remaining ones. Just try to remember from the slide that fraud is a big thing. It's a huge thing. So if you manage to combat fraud and to reduce the fraud amounts in your transactions, in your credit card transactions, in your insurance claims, in your uh, worker compensation receipts, for example, then um, um, that could be a really big deal because uh, that is going to boost your profitability and your return on equity uh, substantially. As with any good thing, if you want to talk about fraud, you need to define it. And, and here you can see um a very wonderful and uh, interesting book on uh, fraud analytics, especially uh, uh, since I uh, since I wrote it myself. Anyway, it's just a bad joke. But here we define fraud as an uncommon. Let's just read that together, right? Fraud is an uncommon, well considered, imperceptibly concealed, time evolving, and often carefully organized crime, which appears in many types and forms. Let's go through the definition once more. Fraud is uncommon. Thank God it's uncommon. Thank God majority of the transactions are not fraudulent. Otherwise, you would be running out of business quite quickly. But being uncommon makes fraud a real challenge because basically what you're doing is you're looking for a needle in a haystack, right? So that means that you're looking for those few fraudulent transactions um, or fraudulent claims or fraudulent money transfers think about money, money laundering, which makes it quite a challenge for modern day analytical techniques because modern day analytical techniques, if they're being confronted with a very skewed data set in which you have a rare event, then you need to help them a bit. You need to make sure that they um, are capable of finding exactly those few needles in that huge haystack. Fraud is well considered. It's intentional, right? So it's, it's intentional and it's with malicious intent. It's imperceptibly concealed. That means that a fraudster tries to play a kind of chameleon 
uh, amongst the legitimate customers. So he or she will try to blend in smoothly and make sure that they go by unnoticed as long as possible, because then they can do all their harm. They can commit all their fraudulent transactions and then um, make sure uh, they, get, they get what they're offered. Fraud is time evolving. That's also very important. That means that fraudsters are continuously on the lookout to beat your analytical model. That means that once you put an analytical model into production, as soon as you put it in production, it gets outdated because fraudsters will try to find the loopholes in your model and try to see where are the weaknesses, how are we gonna, how can we exploit those? That means that we have to very carefully think about what features, what data elements we are gonna use to stay right um, uh, on top of where the fraudsters are uh, conducting their uh, malicious uh, actions. Fraud is often, not always, but often carefully organized. That means that there could be many people that set up fraudulent or malicious practices such that you have to think about networks, for example, right? So it could be that a fraudster does not act in isolation, but he or she is, uh, um, is involved in what we call collusion practices such that they jointly set up their fraudulent initiative and try to steal money from, um, from a, a particular type of counterparty. Here you can see how the fraud management cycle typically uh, goes. So you have a fraud detection mechanism and companies already have fraud detection mechanisms for quite a while right now. Some of them have been a little bit more outdated. Some of them have been a little bit more, more modernized with state-of-the-art analytics, for example. So those fraud detection um, uh, techniques always give you a suspicion score, right? There's always a suspicion score that comes out of any type of fraud detection technique, suspicion score that warrants further investigation. That means that a claim investigator um, then needs to check whether the claim was a claim or a transaction investigator needs to check whether a transaction or a claim was actually fraudulent, yes or no. And once it has been confirmed as fraudulent by the investigator, um, or even by a legal court decision, for example, then we have a fraud confirmation, and then we can feed that back to our automated detection algorithm so as to enrich our data set and say, look, this fraud, this possible fraud, um, fraudulent transaction, the suspicious transaction, as actually uh, can be confirmed as a, as a fraud, fraudulent one. And obviously, it's very important also to prevent fraud as much as possible, such that uh, once the fraud has been confirmed, uh, we're gonna equip our whole system with fraud prevention mechanisms to make sure that um, this type of fraud does not happen anymore in the future. Okay, what are the fraud analytics approaches? There's, I mean, I only have 30 minutes, right? So we have, a, I have a course on my platform of four hours uh, just talking about fraud analytics, right? So it's a, it's a quite exciting area. Um, first of all, we had the expert-based uh, approach. An expert-based approach relies on a set of expert rules, right? So if somebody, um, for example, these are typically if-then rules. If there was a severe car accident and there was a severe injury that took place, but there's no doctor's report, then we can flag the insurance claim as fraudulent. So if somebody files an insurance claim for some uh, health insurance costs that he or she incurred after an accident. And it turned out that the accident was severe with some severe injuries, but there's no doctor that went to the place, then that should raise a flag. That could be a first type of expert-based if then rule to flag a, a transaction as fraudulent. That's purely expert-based. So that's based on your common sense, on your gut feeling. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, there are definitely um, uh, value to be gained from that as well. But with the emergence of, of, of machine learning, um, we started to get techniques, statistical techniques, analytical techniques that could detect fraudulent transactions in data. And there's two types of approaches, right? So there's like a, a supervised learning approach in which you start from a labeled data set. So think of an Excel file. Um, Excel file in the rows, you have claims or money transfers or credit card transactions or worker compensation benefits. And in one particular column, you have a target indicator, which is one or zero, um, one being fraudulent, zero being non-fraudulent. Then we can give that to any type of supervised analytical learning algorithm, such as XGBoost, logistic regression, one of my favorites, um, um, uh, random forest, Deep learning, I wouldn't use deep learning. I'm a bit skeptical about deep learning. Any type of those methods to, to see whether um, the transaction turned out to be fraudulent, yes or no. But sometimes we also want to look at an unlabeled data set. That means an Excel data set in which we don't have that target column available. 
right? We only have the transactions available and we want to look at the ones that deviate from the overall norm, from the, from the, from the average, from the trend, right? And that's where we start looking for anomalies. That's what we call unsupervised learning. And a fourth one that we do quite a lot of work on ourselves is social network learning. Where we're gonna look at a network of entities that um, networks of credit cards, which are being used by, uh, or processed by the same merchants, networks of credit cards, which are being used by the same, um, by the same uh, owner, et cetera. So these are the, all approaches. So um, uh, what are the challenges now? The challenges is that in a fraud analytical model, you should not only look at statistical accuracy, right? Think about likelihood values, think about p-values, think about f-statistics, all these kind of things. But you should also look at interpretability. We want to know what is behind the fraud mechanism, what tactics was the fraudster uh, using. We need to look at operational efficiency. Um, with one credit card provider, for example, we collaborated um, an international credit card provider, and there we had the six-second rule that meant that the system we were about to deploy uh, to detect whether a transaction was fraudulent, yes or no, should make a decision within six seconds, right? So that meant that we actually had to sacrifice some of the statistical accuracy to gain that operational efficiency. There's the economical cost, right? At the end of the day, again, nobody's interested in statistics, right? Nobody's interested in likelihood values. Nobody's interested in, in, in p-values. Nobody's interested in Akaiki information criteria and all these kind of things. You don't have to report that to a, to a fraud investigator, to a manager that deals with, to a CRO, chief risk officer, for example. They're interested in the bottom line impact and the bottom line impact is money, right? And that's why throughout our research, we embed as much as possible profit in the building of our analytical models. And obviously there's also regulatory compliance like privacy and ethics, et cetera, that should be appropriately taken care of. Um, what are the challenges? I'm gonna quickly go through them. There's a plethora of challenges available, but I can only highlight some because of the limited time span. Um, imbalanced data set, feature engineering, social networks, and profit-driven analytics. These are the ones that I will briefly zoom into. Uh, not extensively, there's a lot to say about each of these things, but I'm gonna give you some of our key findings um, uh, from there. So imbalanced data set is exactly that one problem um, of a needle in a haystack. Um, uh, that means that you have a ton of non-fraudulent or legitimate transactions and only these few needles right here that constitute fraudulent transactions, right? So fraud is very rare. And in many real life data sets, you will find that it will be less than 0.5% of the cases, which make them very imbalanced, very skewed, right? So that means that every analytical technique will be tempted towards saying every transaction is illegitimate because if you give it this data set, then the analytical technique will just say every transaction is legitimate and will have an accuracy of 99.833%, which is amazing. But obviously you are not detecting any of the fraudsters. So we need mechanisms to... Um, uh, to pump up the importance of the fraudsters. And there's a couple of mechanisms that have been very popularly used in, in industry and in practice. Like we're gonna increase the weights, we're gonna do oversampling, which means that we look at the fraudsters right here and we, we just replicate them, right? So if, if we have 100 uh, fraudsters, we just replicate that 100. So we increase the distribution of the fraudsters, the amount of fraudsters relatively, so as to um, uh, increase their weight, their importance to the analytical technique. I'm not a big fan of this scheme, right? So because it creates correlations between your observations, you're duplicating things and so on. Um, I'm more of a fan of um, two other schemes. The first one is another layman's approach, if you, was, if you, if you want. Um, that means that you're going to downsample your non-fraudsters. I prefer doing that, right? Um, um, but obviously, this requires that um, you have enough fraudsters in absolute terms. Everybody's talking about big data nowadays, right? I don't think big data is a challenge, right? I don't see any challenges in big data and not in a business setting. Where I do see challenges is in small data, right? A, a smart machine learning algorithm is not a machine learning algorithm that runs on 100 CPUs and so on. That's not, or GPUs, sorry. That's not the challenge. I think a key challenge that many businesses face nowadays is the small data, right? As opposed to big data, right? We know how to tackle big data. We know how to store it. We know how to learn the patterns out of it, but we don't know how to do do it with small data. And we still have small data. If we have new product lines that are being um, that are being launched, for example, where fraud could happen, or special types of free products, special types of free specific products, like uh, project finance, for example, which is the finance 
um, that is uh, needed for uh, building bridges, building railway stations, and so on. So that was just a side remark that to say that fraud data for me is the challenge, not big data. Um, but there's a third scheme that I that we've deployed with some firms worldwide. Uh, so we collaborate with kind of a worldwide firm. I collaborated with most of the banks world. Why, like Bank of America, Lloyd's, HSBC, but also with some governmental agencies like um, the, uh, we were. I worked with the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, also the U.S. Uh, Marines, the Marine Corps in, in, in Quantico, and and uh, with um, with eBay, etc. And there's a third scheme that we've been using with some of these firms worldwide, and that's a synthetic minority oversampling technique or smoothie. Is called. It's developed by Nitesh Chawla in, in, in 2002. And what you basically do is you, you're starting to generate artificial examples. So this is BART, and obviously BART is a fraudster, right? Uh, someone not to be trusted. Um, and there's um, Tim right here. Um, so what we do is instead of replicating BART Tim, right, which would be oversampling, we're just going to create a synthetic um, uh, example along that line by creating a random combination of the feature values for BART and Tim. And that way you create artificial uh, fraudsters, uh, which you can then use to boost uh, here. That's the synthetic example that you created to boost um, the performance of your models, right? And we've developed a variant thereof, which is called Rob Rose, that I will not I will not explain it here. I simply don't have the time, but more than happy to refer you to um, the paper in case you would be interested. Another thing, I think the best way to improve the performance of any machine learning model is is, 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 is not a machine learning technique. I mean, we've worked with convolutional neural networks, we've worked with deep auto encoders, we've worked with long-term, short-term um, machines, memory machines. Um, I mean, for us, uh, and I don't wanna generalize, but I wanna stick to my original setting that I work in with, with lots of firms on mostly uh, structured data. That's what I have to uh, admit as well. We don't have, we have zero added value, but of these advanced deep learning techniques where we do see the added value popping up is in clever data collection and even better clever feature engineering. The best way to boost the performance of any machine learning model is not to buy a fancy tool of uh, a fancy technique or, uh, or a fancy tool that implements all kinds of techniques, but it's to carefully think about um, the ingredients that are at your disposal, more specifically the data or the features that you will derive from it. And um, in marketing, for example, the RFM features have been quite popular, recency, how long ago a transaction took place, frequency, um, any number of transactions per unit of time, and then monetary, um, uh, the monetary value. But there's other features that come into play as well. Like time is a very important information. So when does Bart use his credit card, right? Bart uses his credit card on, Zal no, I'm not doing Zalando. Um, um, I'm doing, um, I don't know, buy something on Amazon or something. And there could be a, a time frame that Bart always uses his credit card in a typical time frame, right? So if you look at, this is a clock and these are, this is a circular histogram depicting like when I do my transactions. So most of the transactions around 10, 11 o'clock. Um, but the time scale is not a continuous scale because you have a break at 12 o'clock. So if you look at this circular histogram, for example, and if you calculate the average time, just the arithmetic average that BART performs a transaction, that would be around three o'clock, right? There's, this is just ludicrous, right? There's no transaction of, that comes near to that moment in time because I do them in the evening. It's because I use the wrong average. I use an arithmetic average. And um, what you can do is instead use a von Mises distribution, which is a, a, a normal distribution, but wrapped around the circle um, such that you can calculate the mean of that von Mises distribution that you fit it on your data to give you the appropriate average timestamp of when a transaction took place. There you can see if you fit a von Mises distribution on this data that the time at which a transaction took place is this time um, and I can then create a confidence interval. And then as soon as a transaction falls outside that confidence interval, then I have a feature that is flagged because that's suspicious, right? There's, this confidence interval tells me that with 95% certainty, BART is purchasing on the internet between 5 p.m. and 4 a.m. But if he then makes a purchase at 2 p.m., that is suspicious. That is not necessarily fraudulent but it is suspicious, so a suspiciousness flag is raised, but it's not necessarily fraudulent. It could be that at 2 p.m. 
I just want to order some tickets or whatever, but it is at least suspicious, right? And that's how we create features, features that raise that suspiciousness score. Uh, I need to uh, hurry up a bit. And basically that's what we do is we look at our data set, we look at our traditional features, and then we add features. And that's the best way to boost the performance of your machine learning model. Once more, it's not um, looking at convolutional neural networks or XGBoost, et cetera, but it's by thinking about those features. You're gonna gain a lot more in predictive performance when you look at those features than when you look at complex techniques, but keep your data constant, right? The best performance benefit of any analytical model comes from the data, not from the technique, though, we do not need those techniques, obviously, but that's the best bet you can make. Um, we've also worked on social networks. Um, we had a, a system deployed, which is called Gotcha, gotcha with the Belgian uh, social security services uh, that uses social network analysis to detect social security fraud. And that very system is also now um, used by the Brazilian federal police to unravel criminal networks. I believe it was in Rio de Janeiro. And um, um, yeah, the thing there is that you look at, um, I'm gonna do this and try and do that in a nutshell. You look at networks between credit card holders, merchants and credit cards, for example, or you look at networks between companies because they're shifting resources from one company to another. Um, and you create those networks first, and then you featureize them. Right? So you bring the network into a tabular format, into a structured tabular format, using all kinds of fancy featureization mechanisms. And by doing that featureization, basically what you're doing is you're enriching your data and you're giving more opportunities uh, for the analytical algorithm to find something interesting. You can think about it as a cook, right? So a cook has us fixed uh, pans and, and devices to cook, but if you give it better ingredients, then the dish might taste better in the end. That's the analogy that we can draw right here. Um, here, yeah, I'm gonna skip that. Um, um, one thing, because I see that I'm nearing the end right now. Um, one thing I also want to say is that uh, what we do in, in, in my team is that we, do, we don't look at um, uh, statistical measures, right? Uh, well, we do, like, we do look at them, but they're not of key importance. But if we present a fraud analytical model to some kind of manager and we say it has a, a, a very good uh, Akaiki information criterion or Schwartz information criterion or likelihood values are perfectly good or the coefficients have all significant p-values below 0.001, I mean, nobody, as I said, nobody cares about that. Uh, what they care about is how much, uh, how much fraud is going to reduce thanks to the effort of uh, analytics. And what we do is, um, if you look at logistic regression, which is one of my favorite techniques and still being used by many banks nowadays worldwide, um, if you would let me guess, I think you, every one of you attending the seminar today is the subject of at least five logistic regression models being run on our behavior to detect whether we're gonna default, to detect whether um, where we commit fraudulent transactions, et cetera. And what we did was we took logistic regression and we said logistic regression by default optimizes across entropy error, uh, which is based on maximum likelihood. But we kind of got out that objective function. We said not relevant. We put in um, um, an economic objective function, right? That's what we did. And here you can see that, look, we look at our uh, confusion matrix in terms of classification costs. Uh, if, we, if we predict a transaction as legit, that means that we're gonna let it pass. If it is an actual legit transaction, then the cost is zero. But if it would have been a fraudulent transaction, then we let a fraudulent transaction pass. And then it's obviously the amount of the transaction. If I predict a transaction as positive and it's actually negative, then what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm, I have administrative costs, the, the costs of the fraud investigator to check the transaction and to make that decision to block it. And that's my CA. And here I have the similar one, if I predict it to be fraudulent and it's actual uh, positive, predict it to be fraudulent means you block it, uh, then we look at um, uh, CA, right? Um, and then we have a set of transactions. And basically this is our cost function that we have derived um, and that we have, um, yeah, this is the general cost function. We're not gonna go into too much uh, of the mathematics because I, I realize most of you are joining uh, in their lunch break and it's not healthy to have a good sandwich with uh, two complex uh, formulas. But basically um, 
we look at this, this cost function and then we uh, take those costs into account. And then this gives us this cost function, which we use to steer the parameters of, um, of our logistic regression model. And um, then we calculate some costs um, of that logistic regression model and we tune our beta parameters like the intercept, but also the, uh, the parameter estimates in such a way that this cost is minimized. And here you can see, um, how does um, we did this using logistic regression because logistic regression is a white box transparent model. And um, just to give you an idea, if we would do a logistic regression using scikit-learn, for example, which is a well-known Python package that implement, implements regularized logistic regression, by the way, then what we would have is that if I would do it traditionally using the, that traditional likelihood-based objective function, then that would be our optimal beta one and beta two parameters. So that's what a pure statistician would do. And no offense to statisticians, right? Because we collaborate with a lot of statisticians and they can really help us uh, uh, work in this, this out as well. Um, um, so this is our traditional logistic regression starting point. Uh, but if we take our cost as the objective, uh, so these are the beta one and beta two values, right? So the beta one is quite small and beta two is quite high. Um, but uh, if we do our, our model, then we see that if we start from here, this is how the optimization goes and it ends up in a totally different point, right? Because you can see that the traditional um, point versus the profit optimal point is uh, completely different from one another, which makes it worthwhile to, 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 to question this and to see like, um, yeah, why the difference and what are the cost implications thereof? And there are cost implications because our model directly optimizes um, cost or uh, optimizes profit. And uh, we've done this for logistic regression. Uh, we've also done that for you, those of you that are interested um, in churn prediction, right? Uh, which is, uh, we've collaborated with a few telco firms as well to predict churn prediction. This model right now, for example, I can tell you that is being, um, 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 was developed in collaboration with BNP Paribas Fortis, uh, where they're currently studying its uh, its usage in their in their systems. But we also have um, profit driven decision trees that we have developed for churn prediction and profit driven logistic regression for churn prediction. It's all a bit the same mechanism, except that um, the profit functions are obviously uh, domain specific. Right. Okay. Good. Right. This I said. If you want more information, I can definitely refer you to my online course. Um, uh, it's a four hour course, I think it is. Yep, uh, it's a four hour course on fraud analytics. You can enroll uh, if you want. Um, it's not a free course, unfortunately. It's a commercial initiative that I set up. Um, I'm only an 80% professor at K11. So the remaining 20%, um, I run this Blue Courses uh, initiative. And um, yeah, it's um, part also for the sustainability purpose to clean up the oceans. So. Key takeaways and fraud analytics. Um, we started by saying it's uh, the data sets are imbalanced. So um, that we need to cope with them and we need to carefully think about how we're gonna do that. Next thing we said was um, um, features. Feature engineering is really very important. Uh, the best performance benefit is not from the technique but from the data by carefully designing your features. Uh, the third thing that we said was social networks, right? Think about networks between your data um, such that um, you can featureize those as well, add into your data set and as such enrich your data set. Um, and the fourth thing that we said was that actually what matters is the bottom line impact is profit. So um, yeah, so, and, and we discussed how you can embed this in your, um, in your analytical models. I think that was my last slide. I had to uh, hurry up a bit. Uh, to fit in the 30 minute, but I think 30 minute is okay. Just a brief um, overview, I think is, um, is definitely okay.